Hey family, it's Monika. Today I have a special guest with us. We have Dr. Joy DeGruy. She is a nationally renowned researcher, an author. She's also a fellow social worker. So I want to introduce Dr. Joy. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast today. And I and I want to give you time to kind of introduce um, post traumatic to those of us in the social work profession who might not be as familiar with your work. Okay, um, so it's interesting because I taught uh, in a school of social work for like 20 years, um, mm -hmm. MSW students. Yeah. Um, and even, I mean, even when I was doing the work then, uh, there was very little done on historical trauma as it related to people of African descent. So my work, uh, based on my book, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing, so basically all what I did in my research was looking at historical trauma in people of African descent. Now we've looked at trauma with other groups. We've looked at um, victims of natural disasters. We've looked at victims of war, um, Jewish Holocaust uh, victims. And so it, I thought it was peculiar that an in, the institution of enslavement, which lasted for hundreds of years, uh, no one thought to look at that. Right. that particular you know right. long enduring trauma yeah um and more importantly what happens is you know no one would discount um someone jewish looking at their history no one would discount uh but the moment we talk about um, african americans oh that was over a long time ago i said wait a minute if i can experience a, a traumatic mental health injury as a result of hearing about something horrific happening to someone i love what do you think several hundred years of trauma produced? So my work was really looking at that and um, what it looks like, how does it manifest? Um, and some of it people already know in self-loathing. Oh, you know, she was pretty, even though she was dark. Uh, he was attractive. He was light skinned and mm -hmm. good hair. You know, all of, the, all of that language, all that, that narrative right. is one that speaks of us actually self kind of self-loathing but my my uh, major question is where did that come from i've been to seven countries in africa mm -hmm. uh, it's not an african thing at least not yet it's becoming yeah. that as they mm -hmm. uh begin to look like us but again it's this whole idea of what does that injury look like as it relates to how i view myself how i view other people that look like me what do i believe about my self-efficacy as a person um and what do i believe about the systems of care uh, that are currently happening uh, as it relates to me, even looking at COVID, you can't Absolutely. avoid. Absolutely. And I think that's so critical in, in this time and as well as other times that we've been in moments like this, where there's been this surge exactly. of things that we've already know that are impacting the community, but then it brings this limelight. But I think your work kind of undergirds everything that we know about what we're seeing now. And I think that that's why it's so important for us to kind of root and ground the conversation in the work that you've already laid out because it answers the question of why why are we seeing what we see and right. now i think that the bigger answer is how do we begin to as a community because i know you talk about in your book recreating the village how can we begin right. to do that to help um curb some of these health disparities that we're seeing within the community right. so um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is, um, with this enduring legacy, for those of us who are working in the profession of social work, or myself being a therapist in private practice, um, what do you think the harm or consequence is of us continuing to work within the system without us having this historical understanding of our oppression? I think that, you know, one of the, one of the oaths that one takes when you're working in community, you're working with others, particularly as it relates to mental health is to do no harm yeah. my feeling is my feeling is that harm is being done if you don't have enough information um you're going to harm people right mm -hmm. so what we have to recognize that is the people that are in front of us whether that you know we are african-american and the, and the client is african-american very often it's the opposite the client is african-american and the clinician is white um and and basically doesn't even understand that there's a historical distrust yeah of you know uh, the medical profession in general and here i am having to face someone whom i don't trust uh, mm -hmm. to help me and that person may know so little about my experience that they actually cause me harm so what do i mean by by harm 
So, um, real true story. <laughs> this is why it's so hard for me to, to, to do this in a short period of time. Yeah. Um, we were trying to establish a, a, a standalone health, mental health center in Portland, Oregon, a tall order in a city that um, really basically prides itself on being the whitest city in the United States. Okay, mm-hmm. literally prides itself on that. So, so here we were trying to develop a standalone. It, there was there was precedent, so we had uh, for the the Latinx community, they had a standalone system. Um, for uh, the Native American community, there was a standalone. For the Jewish community, there was a standalone mm-hmm. mental health center. But for Black folks, uh, someone would would get the money coming down from the county, the city, the state, the feds, and go, oh oh, we'll serve Black people. We'll put a pilot. Uh, program in the middle of the black community because we want the money to serve you then we'll find some token black people nobody of of authority no one with um you know uh, that is a a manager or you know a a director it's going to be you know you know frontline staff but that that would be your point to which you're saying oh we have african americans present so now let's move it forward true story uh they did that in the black community because they wanted to get the money to serve the black community um, and they figured, what do I need to know? Yeah. I'll just plop you know, a center down there in the middle. Right. And what happened is a gentleman shows up. He's maybe 6'5", 270, bipolar, mm-hmm. uh, has been off his medicine for a few weeks because he lost his job and he heard that the clinic could help him with his medicine, right? So he's coming in there for help. Right. One of the things that circulated a week before he showed up was a memo that the manager put out, a white female manager, that we will no longer serve angry or agitated black men. Wow. <laughs> well, this is a program to serve black people. So this black man shows up. Um, of course, he, you know, he not a single synapse is firing, firing right for him. But when he walks in the room, who is there sitting before him? But Cindy Lou Who from Arkansas with her MSW. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's now at this point when she sees him come in the room, it's turning the color of ripened fruit right. because she's now remembering all the things daddy told her about men that look like him. So now he shows up 6'5", 270 bipolar off his medicine for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And he, even though he can't pull any of his, his thinking really fully together, he knows I better not scare that white girl. Right. Somewhere coming through that was don't scare the white girl. So he gets in the chair, he pushes the chair back, he turns, diverts his gaze, he tries to be as small as he can because he could look at her and see that she's already frightened. And he's doing all that to take care of himself. So the first, the first thing he has to do is take care of her. Mm. And, and I would assert that that's harm to him. Right. Now her response, her resp- response is, oh, but I'm not a racist. My response is, I don't care. 300 years of history entered the room right. and you weren't able to navigate that space yeah. because you didn't think there was anything more you needed to do but get, but get your MS of W, which likely didn't cover people like him, except to mm-hmm. not deal with them. Exactly. So what I'm saying is it caused him, and I argue, you know, I argue to the state at the state level, it took us seven years to get a standalone center. Mm. Seven years. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, uh, what do we need to know to walk into a black community? Mm-hmm. My, 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 my MSW students inevitably, whenever I would ask them, okay, let, I, I just want you to sharpen your skills. Tell me what you're going to do. There's a huge influx of Romanians. Mm-hmm. What, what, what are you going to do? Hands go up. Oh, well, we want to consider uh, religion and language, and we want to consider um, gender issues. And all of a sudden, all this comes up. And I name different groups, and then I say African-American community, and there's silence. Oh, wow. And I say, so am I to assume that you don't believe that there's anything you need to learn to go into my community? Right, right. Nothing. And then they get mad. Well, you're saying, I said, I'm not saying anything. You're saying everything right now. When you can't put anything on the board because you don't think there's anything more you need to know. Right. And see, again, that that sets up this dynamic. And even uh, students at MSW students that get sent out into the community to do their practice, you know, and they're in these um, field, you know, their field placements and they don't have a clue. They do harm, (laughs) they do harm and um, say and do and behave in a way. And then their response is, well, you know, I'm feeling uncomfortable. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Uh, But again, it's not totally on them because we have institutions that don't feel it's necessary to educate folks about anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And I think that that is so important, especially when we're in this era of trauma-informed care and there's been all this language around ACEs and adverse childhood experiences, but it, that does not contextualize what we've experienced as a culture. So right. there seem to be models there, but they don't encompass the depth or the breadth of what we experience. And then there's not that cultural, culturally competent base that it was really embedded into our profession to be culturally competent, but the models just don't seem to be there. And I'm gonna ask you about that later in terms of models. Um, so the, the next question that I wanted to know is, I mean, we know kind of what's going on on the political landscape, the social landscape in terms of COVID and the, the deaths that are still happening under COVID, um, people in our community still dying. And I, I watched a lot of your lives where you were talking about how we were using this term dying disproportionately but that in and of itself speaks to post-traumatic slave syndrome. And I know that you're really big about putting out there that you don't want this to be a pathology of, of black people, but you just want this to be an understanding of kind of the, to contextualize what we've experienced without putting a label, a mental health label on the community. Right, it's not something that should be in the DSM. Absolutely. Right. So, because in DSM, now what you've done is you've absolutely pathologized black people. And mm -hmm. you've also said that there's someone that is going to come in that can fix you. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. We're right. going to find out what this is. Because what, what post traumatic implies is not just that we have had historical injury and contemporary injury. We keep being injured, kind of hard to heal. Yeah. You, you keep breaking my leg and then you complain that I limp, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have this kind of ongoing process where uh, you're being assaulted, mm -hmm. but, but no, nobody's kind of um, understanding that, you're, that, you're, that you've been injured. Yeah. And so it's not about, you know, like, again, it's, it's, it's not something you could fix in a, uh, in a clinical setting because it requires social justice. Yeah. You got to stop hitting me, right? You got to stop doing these other structural and institutional assaults. Right. Uh, so not just someone sitting in a room talking to me softly or medications that can fix this. Uh, what has to fix this is social justice. Okay. Totally understand and get that. So with, within that system, kind of what you just explained, when you have to give so much validity to what we've experienced, how, how do you help navigate um, people within the community and outside of the community who say that we're, we're simply making excuses, that the reason why we don't succeed is um, because maybe we're not working hard enough or we need to strive more or work harder. What would be your response to that narrative? Uh, my response would be that we worked free for over 300 years. Right. Okay. So uh, anybody talk about working harder, I don't know how much harder you can work than that. Yeah. Um, and then to have worked for 300 years for free and to end up uh, inheriting debt. Yes. Right? Because you, you didn't even own yourself, let alone anything that you, you know, you worked for. Uh, right. so there, there's a lot of layers. Like people say, well, you know, I wasn't, I didn't own slaves and my family, you know, pulled themselves up from the bootstraps. I said, yeah, but we provided those bootstraps. Right. We right. provided Hard them bootstraps. for free. And we didn't have any boots. Uh, you know, like my, fa my father would always say, if a, if a, you know, white man has a cold, then a black man has pneumonia. So when you start looking at ACE, the ACEs study, adverse childhood experiences, you're going to go, okay, uh, if, if you're talking about harm, that was done on about 16,000 majority white people. Absolutely. That's who, who the, you know, was the, they, who they looked at. Right. Um, so again, you're going to, if you're looking at black folks, like uh, we were just recently, I was doing some work with um, some folks in New York, um, and they were talking about the digital divide, right? And they were saying, with this, one of the, the school districts said, well, we're going to get, we're going to get, um, you know, computers out to everybody right to kids you know but somehow the red line <laughs> didn't didn't include the folks who were most at risk the folks who for example didn't have internet mm -hmm. let alone a computer so you give them a computer there's no internet there's no fiber optics for it right. because it's not even piped for it because there's no intention of serving these people right. and then maybe it's a grandmother that's raising uh, the grandchildren and may not even understand how to navigate the technology so we start to talk about helping you see yeah. Mm -hmm. um, without a, a, the proper lens, you can't help. Right. You don't even know how to help. So right. like, and that's just one simple thing. We're talking about, oh, great, let's just get everybody a computer. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to leave it. Well, they didn't access it. Well, really, did they, ha did they even have, you know, well, did, what, were they able to pay the electric bill that month? I mean, right. there's so many things that 
there's so many things that layers of oppression that are going on at the same time and right. people are navigating that people are figuring out how to survive mm -hmm. um but don't beat me up mm -hmm. and most certainly do not pathologize me because we're far uh, from weak fragile victims we've done this much with nobody concentrating on the nature of our injury right you see so we've come this far with no help absolutely <laughs> And I'm saying as black clinicians, as black social workers, uh, as black psychologists, psychiatrists, what have you, um, we have a unique lens into the folks that we're working with. Yeah. And not to, not to say that everybody that looks like us behaves like us, right? right. So you have, not, you, have, you, have, you have, I've run into teachers, administrators, uh, clinicians uh, that are so disconnected from themselves that yeah. the only thing they do when they see people of color is punish them. Mm. They, they punish them yeah. um and and i and, you know i've had i had students that would with uh or, or that or folks that figure um i had i had a student once that was unhappy with her uh, the clients she was working with and i said why is that she goes because i don't know everybody just seems to be doing so well <laughs> i'm going okay <laughs> so uh, again in her mind because her own experience had been consistent in perpetual drama if yeah. there is no continuing perpetual drama, it throws her off, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to deal with her doing her own personal work before right. she could actually do work with other people because she had herself become accustomed to crisis. She lived in crisis or her for her own life. Does that make sense? And yeah. so I'm not. Um, so I and when when she would tell me that she was unhappy, I noticed that it would always happen when there was no drama going on with her clients. Hmm. And it's the only time she felt like she was really doing something is there was something, a crisis. But she yeah. said it's born out of her, her own experience. And so, you know, again, how important is it to know um, your own narrative, have your own narrative? Yeah. Right? And, and that's right. one of the things that I noticed that you mentioned in the book, too, about um, kind of language or, or telling our own story and how important that is for us to be able to reclaim our narrative, to be able to talk about our, our experiences and then how that's rooted in, um, kind of how we show up in the world every day and and i know a lot of people say that we're not a monolith in terms of a people but we did have a collective injury in terms Absolutely. of what we experienced and how that manifests itself in our families right and see the thing that's so amazing about black folks um and what what everyone always says is they go well you know all black people well all any people yeah <laughs> <laughs> that goes without saying you know that absolutely goes without saying but it becomes the um, you know, uh, this kind of a, a, a concept of, well, you know, there's no, um, every, she's, she's trying to tell me that everybody, I said, why is it we could talk about everyone else's trauma and they not be, uh, you know, resigned to somehow uh, pathologizing the whole community or looking at all black people one way? Right. Who does that? You know right. what I'm saying? And so yet it's consistently, well, are you saying? I said, well, if you're talking about Jewish Holocaust is every Jewish person experiencing or experiencing the same amount of trauma as we, nobody's going to ask that. But when it comes to black people, and part of that has to do with the dissonance, yeah. the cognitive dissonance that people experience talking about black people at all. Mm -hmm. I believe our very presence produces dissonance mm -hmm. because you see, it's, it's a reminder. Yes. And, and it's not just back then it's right now. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, I have a, a a picture of a woman who's protesting uh, the state's opening, a white woman, um, you know, why aren't they opening? And she has a picture of, of an enslaved African. And, you know, they used to put these big muzzles and things on black people, chains and yeah. all kinds of things. And she said, no, um, masks belong on slaves. Hmm. <laughs> so she was protesting the mask, showing an enslaved African, mm -hmm. saying, you know, only slaves, you know, should be wearing these masks. And wow. so I'm like, wow, that was like, well, yesterday. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a, uh, that, that systems and individuals that have not left that notion of somehow we're not quite, we're not, we're not quite uh, worthy. Yeah. You know, our, our injuries aren't worthy of, of the, the level of scholarship and research that everybody else is, is right. having. Right. And if, right. if we do bring it out, then we're, 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 we're making excuses. I mean, I mean, when I look at that, I'm going, where are we benefiting from that? Yeah. You know, I mean, it, there's just, it's, it's, it's a kind of a ridiculous assumption that always gets thrown out there. We have to be careful not to be, become part of that. Right. Absolutely. That's and right. I think one of the things that you just brought up is 
the ideology that perpetuates white supremacy and racism within African Americans and our identity is the same thing that seemingly perpetuates it in white identity as well. Right. Not being able to let go of those ideas. Case in point, uh, recently, um, um, the, the Yale Child Center uh, did some research looking at bias in teachers. They looked at something like 100, 126 teachers, something like that, mm -hmm. and they showed them some videos and they said, please let us know if you see, uh, point out any um, potential uh, uh, problem behavior. That's what they asked them. Show us, you know, just look at this video. And what they did was they would ask them to press a, bu a button if they were, you know, if they saw a potential problem emerging. And of course, uh, there were no problem behaviors in these, uh, in these videos, in these scenarios. Mm -hmm. And so they looked at the trajectory of their gaze because they wanted to know where you, if you're looking for a problem, where, right. where, where are you going to look? Right. <laughs> if you look more at black children than, than white children, and especially more at black boys. Now, yeah. understand of these 126 teachers or what have you, um, what we have to understand is there were black, black teachers in there too. And they too have been taught yeah. to see themselves as a problem. Yeah. In fact, they were able to look at a classroom of, of children that were off task, right? So they were looking to see what when the teacher was going to see which students that were off task. There's a black student, a white student, both off task, both off task doing the same off task behavior. Mm -hmm. But the teacher didn't see the white kid. Every right. single time they saw the black kid. Right. Even though they were both, you know, uh, uh, actually reflecting the exact same behavior at the same time. But they didn't see the white kid. They saw the black kid because that's who they looked for. Right. Now, in our profession, most people would advocate some type of cultural competence training or some level of um, CEUs to help with that kind of um, um, phenomenon. Um, what do you think best positions someone who works within our community to, to not see that in our children? Not only, not only a, a white teacher, but also black teachers as well. So what I advocate and what I do around the country is, you know, people will, will hire me and they'll get the, the, just the clip, you know, they'll get the first little clip. Mm -hmm. I have a 10 week graduate level course that I teach. Mm -hmm. I teach it in the community. Mm -hmm. I teach it to parents. I teach it to, uh, to youth. You know, I teach it to administrators, teachers, social workers, anyone you put in front of me, but it's certainly not something we can trivialize and we can just yeah. say, Oh yeah. Additionally, I could just, you know, go talk to a couple of black people. I'll be good. No, right, right, right. Be trained like you need. Everyone else needs to be trained. And my my work not only explains the nature of the injury, but what is working. What are the evidence based models that are working with people that look like me? Yeah. Right? So uh, again, we're never asked, and there's this assumption that people know what's best. Mm -hmm. You can't do that without engaging your community. Right. You know, and so part of the healing is engaging in relationships with the community, which right. is what every white social worker wants to avoid. Mm. <laughs> Don't want to deal with them. Right. I, here's my identified client as though they sprouted from nothing. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to somehow sit in a room with them and they're going to be better. Mm. I don't know anything about their family. I don't even engage their family. I don't even go into their community, mm. but I'm getting ready <clears throat> to tell them what they need to do to negotiate their health. Right. And so again, it's, it's just, it's not plausible that we are competent if we aren't educated about it. And yeah. it's not just this, you know, oh my goodness, be kind of Negroes month. Oh, here's right. a good, great, great time to focus in. You know, if you would work with any other people, if you work with victims of rape, you know, you ordinarily, when you're working with them, don't put them in the same room with people that are going to trigger that injury. Yeah. So you, you, you're going to be careful. You're not going to get, you know, um, Bernard, you know, from, you know, a great social worker, LCSW. I'm not putting him in there with her. Right. Right. Because I'm understanding the nature of her injury. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, really being sensitive about people who have for so long uh, been mistreated. And we can, we can look at COVID. Everybody looked at COVID and they were like, oh, my God, the whole world now knows that disproportionately black people were dying disproportionately before COVID. Absolutely. It's called racism. That's the pre-existing condition. Yeah. It's racism. You know, and so there's this kind of, oh, my God, it's black. Why are you surprised? 
we're 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 topping the charts with health, you know, uh, with heart disease and hypertension and uh, diabetes. This is no nothing new, but right. it just kind of. And again, even when you start looking at the the the, le- the level of care, and this is you know just on a personal level, you know, I have a family member that had it not been for advocacy would have been allowed to let die. Just mm-hmm. forty six years old with no pre existing conditions other than racism, and and again there was a, a difference in the level of care she received based on the level of advocacy. Mm-hmm. So I brought in a friend of mine as a doctor to speak with her doctors. And all of a sudden, on a dime, her entire care changed. Change. Because yeah. there's a doctor looking at what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And so you have to also recognize that white supremacy doesn't stop with policing or the folks carrying the, the, the signs like the woman with the, you know, uh, only slaves and you know <laughs> anyway yeah. So yeah. Th- that mentality is is re- there everywhere so we can't okay. assume that the nurses doctors and staff who have not been breastfed on racism themselves so if you have two ventilators you have two ventilators mm-hmm. you have three white people who need it and one black person <clears throat> mm-hmm. who, who determines who gets it and based on, well, let's look at the math, the likelihood of who will survive. You see, when you start going down that road, mm-hmm. th- which is where people go, and if you happen to be in there by yourself, right. you came right. in here alone, mm-hmm. no one to advocate for you, that's right. frightening for me because Absolutely. I know too much about it at this point. Yeah. That you better go in there. And of course, not because of COVID, you can't go in there. Well, we're going to have to FaceTime. I'm going to send a drone in. We're going to do something because I'm going to look at you and I'm going to look at the person I love and I'm going to look at the level of care they're receiving. Now, it may sound paranoid, but the problem is people are following us, <laughs> even though we are, we may be paranoid. I don't doubt that. Absolutely. We have a reason to be, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's all, all it, there's nothing new going on except the rest of the world is being exposed to what we've always known. Right. And we have normalized those disparities. We we have normalized disproportionality. It's almost like we say it, it rolls off the tongue as an acceptable thing in terms of uh, we're not trying to deconstruct the disproportionality or the, or the overrepresentation. We just may, merely state it now as right. though it's a norm we should embrace and take. Oh, yeah, of course. We're not going to look at why we are disproportionately impacted. We're not going to look at the neighborhood's uh, availability of like fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, the availability of uh, the uh, chains of supermarkets that don't cost astronomical amounts. When we start looking at communities and how they're how they're built, mm-hmm. and all of the the businesses that are there, all of the you you can actually look at the kind of fast food, and I can tell you who lives in the neighborhood. Yeah. So yeah. all of these things impact health. Right. right. And all of these things impact you know how we navigate, mm-hmm. uh, but everyone goes home and assumes that we have the same experience, mm. you know? Yeah. And again, am I going to really tell you, Cindy, that from Arkansas? Yeah. That this is the first black person with a warm body you've been in the same room with? I don't think so. Mm. And I shouldn't have to educate you in order for you to help me. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the things that you say that I, I really, I recited a lot, um, when you talk about these manifestations of our um, trauma, and you talk about how we've internalized some of those things within our community as being a part of our culture now. And you say um, that there's poison in the cookies. Poison and, in the cookies. Yeah. So um, what that means, or what I take that to mean, is all those adaptive ways or maladaptive ways that those traumatic experiences now show up in our culture. So can you talk a little bit about those? Um, those maladaptive or the uh, appropriate adapt- adaptation while living in a hostile environment? So what happens, like for anyone, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a victim of war, uh, for example, if, uh, you'll find that children, children just still play because children are children, right? But when they play, they may play, I'm going to shoot you, you fall in the ditch. And then we'll, we'll, we'll switch and you shoot me and I fall in the ditch. So they are playing what they're seeing in their environment, mm-hmm. right? So if they're playing war and death because that's what they see war and right. death and so what happens if you start looking at generations of people that have been taught that you're not only um inferior to everyone else you're not even fully human right okay so we have dehumanized you 
And um, but at the same time, like anyone else, you have to survive under this oppressive regime. So I always use the example that most people see uh, and we've all seen. And I'll ask a question of my audience, and particularly if they're African-Americans, it doesn't matter what level of education. I say if you're in a bank and there's someone black in the bank and they have children and the children are like four, you know, five, that age, where are the children in proximity to the parent? And everyone will go, just think about where are they? Oh, they're right next to the parent. Sometimes they're actually holding on. Yeah. Uh, and if they should just move to the right a couple of steps or to the left, the parent is going, oh, come get get back over here, get back over here. Kid can't move. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things we know, we know about secure attachment. We know how important it is for right. children at certain ages to learn level of autonomy. In other words, to be able to explore safely in the environment. And so what happens is in the same bank that you have the little four, five year olds that are next to their parents adhering because a kid can't move to the right or the left, a white kid is rolling around <laughs> it's oh, looking okay. down the aisle, walking up, asking your name. Um, and so both sets of children, and this is in you know a public setting, there's no education, no professor joy there, but there's an education going on. So the black child is learning something and the white child is learning something. And the, what the black child is learning is I can't move and go and play like the white child because I'll get in trouble. Yeah. It's their world, not my world. Right. Now the parent hasn't, you know, the parent is, you know, just don't move. The white kid is looking at the black kid and going, huh, wonder what's wrong with them. They can't move. Mm -hmm. And so what the child will ultimately do, because it is a task of development to be able to explore in one's environment and to find autonomy. It is a natural developmental stage. So the black children eventually try to find a time to escape. So when the parent gets to the teller and there's a, a little, you know, there's a the counter, the kids are lower than the counter. So they're trying to sneak and roll, roll down underneath the counter because yeah. the parent can't see them. But there's maybe another black man or woman in the, in the line, in the back, mm -hmm. doesn't know this parent, but looks at the little <laughs> kid, gives them the death stare. Yeah. And the little kid looks at this absolute stranger, gets back in line. Because now this parent has this parent's back. But what are we really, what message are we sending to that child? Mm. We're, at, we're all sending a message, but the reason for that is maybe like Emmett Till, yeah. uh, Tamir Rice. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 we're saying, you know, we got to keep our eyes on you because it's dangerous for you. Right. But you are instilling in that child fear, yes. anger, and shame. Mm. Because they don't understand, you know, and the, if you ask the parent, why, why can't the kid move? They'll, they'll say they don't need to be moving. Why? Right. Well, where, where were they in the bank? Right. Well, that's exactly where they were. And they were in the bank right next to their parent. So again, it, be, it, gets, it becomes cultural, passed along to the point where it becomes toxic. Yeah. Right? So children should be able to move and play and explore. Yeah. They're not destroying anything. They're not in trouble. But I understand the fear. We don't even know why we're so afraid of that. We don't know why it we, we get worried. But I think that's that's epigenetic. It, you know, yeah. those are the kind of things, survival behaviors that get passed along. And then some of those we have to examine to determine if we need to really keep doing that. Hey everybody, it's Monika and thank you for watching. Today's video was a snippet of the full interview that I did with Dr. Joy DeGruy around her work, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And you can check that full interview out on my podcast, the Afrocentric Social Worker Podcast. And I'll leave a link just in case you wanna check that out. I'll also leave a link to the blog and that will include all the show notes and the books and the links that we talked about in the podcast episode today. If you want to stay up to date on future episodes and interviews from researchers and teachers and scholars within the African American community who can help us ground our discussions and change the conversations around the collective experiences of African Americans while centering on our need for restoration and healing. Please be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you can be notified of any time that I upload a new video. Thank you all so much for watching and as always, be well.